This is the WGNS Action Line, talking with Rutherford County newsmakers about what matters most to you. Your host, J. Paul Newman of the Monthly District Attorney Show, will now take you on a journey to explore recent Rutherford County court cases, cold cases, and more. We welcome everyone to the program. My name is J. Paul Newman. My co host today are Rutherford County District Attorney General Jennings Jones and Rutherford County Assistant District Attorney Trevor Lynch. We thank WGNS for providing the airtime. And we also thank our producer, Scott Walker. Most of all, we thank you for listening. We will begin our broadcast after you listen to these important messages. Excited to announce that Capstar Bank is now officially a division of Old National Bank. The friends you've made while banking right here over the years are still here. And so are those delicious, warm, homemade cookies. Everything you enjoyed about Capstar is still at Old National Bank. In Murfreesboro at 2230 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Come on over and enjoy warm cookies with friends while doing your banking at Old National Bank. Old National Bank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. On today's Cold Case Profile, we will highlight the 2015 murder of William Greg Hawkins. And you will hear from the lead investigator, Detective Kyle Norod. You will also hear from Darren Hawkins, the brother of Greg Hawkins. And you will hear from Janet Hawkins, the widow of Greg Hawkins. They join me and former District Attorney General William C. Weitzel and the present District Attorney General Jennings Jones as we ask once again for your help in solving the murder of William Greg Hawkins. And now, please listen to this very special Cold Case Profile. Every homicide, every rape, every robbery affects the entire community. People who are victims of these crimes need closure. The people who committed these crimes must be held accountable. Law enforcement needs the community's help in seeking justice. Please listen as we review an unsolved mystery in this month's Cold Case Profile. On the morning of October the 16th, 2015, 24-year-old Brandy Hawkins had been fishing with her father. After a few hours, they decide to head back home. Brandy remains in the boat, while her father exits the boat to bring back the boat trailer. Brandy Hawkins loses sight of her father as he walks away and into the parking lot. The time is about 11 a.m. Brandy Hawkins hears what she believes to be gunfire. She walks to the parking lot. There she finds her father, 53-year-old Greg Hawkins. Greg Hawkins has been shot, and it appears his vehicle has been burglarized. Greg Hawkins dies that day, October the 16th, 2015. And on this day, the Hawkins family is here to ask for your help. They want to know why 53-year-old Greg Hawkins was killed and they want to know who killed him. On this broadcast, we will talk to the lead investigator in this case, Detective Kyle Norod of the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office, and we will talk to two members of Greg Hawkins' family. The first is Darren Hawkins. Darren Hawkins is the younger brother of Greg Hawkins. The second special guest is Janet Hawkins. Janet Hawkins is Greg Hawkins' widow. She is a person who can not only share with us what she has lost, but also what our community has lost. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jennings Jones, your district attorney. Today, we will be talking about the murder that occurred on the Mona boat ramp. 
This murder was investigated by Detective Kyle Norod of Rutherford County. Detective Norod, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. What, what motivated you to choose law enforcement as a career and about your experience as a law enforcement officer? I feel like that it was really a calling. Whenever I was young, I always had respect for law enforcement officers. I know that they help people sometimes at the worst times of their lives, and I just really felt like it was a calling. On to the murder itself, can you describe the area where the crime occurred? Specifically, describe where it's located and what type of area it is. It's uh, known as the Mona Boat Ramp area. It's a real rural area out in Walter Hill. Uh, it's off West Jefferson Pike. As you would imagine, it's a place where people come to fish and put their boats in the water. As for when this crime occurred, how were you able to establish a time frame? Well, we got the time frame actually from the victim's daughter, Brandy Hawkins, and the kayaker that was in the area. They heard the shots. We know that it was on October 16th, and we know that the time of the gunshots was around 11 a.m. The newspaper account relates that Greg Hawkins interrupted a crime in progress. What can you share with us regarding that? Upon examining the vehicle and the evidence at the crime scene, we could tell that uh, the vehicle had been broken into because there was obvious damage to the vehicle. The reward on this case now stands at $50,000. If someone has information regarding this case, who should they contact? They can, they can contact me, Detective Kyle Norod, with the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office. My number is 615-904-3043. Again, that's 615-904-3043. Or if they want to remain anonymous, they can call Rutherford County Crime Stoppers. And that number is 615-893-7867. We urge anyone in the public that might have information regarding this act to come forward to the police or to Crime Stoppers. You can do that anonymously with the number we previously listed, uh, and it would be of great service to the community and also to help bring justice in this case. We want to welcome uh, Darren Hawkins to the studio, and uh, Mr. Hawkins, you're the brother of Greg Hawkins, but tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what type of work you do, things like that. Uh, Greg and I grew up in uh, Mount Juliet, and um, in the Mount Juliet Hermitage area, and we both were uh, worked at Nissan in Smyrna, Tennessee as engineers. Okay. Uh, and you're his younger brother? I'm his only brother. Okay, and what's the age difference between There's the two of you? 11 months difference in our age. Did you like the outdoors as much as Greg did? Yeah, we did. We did a, we did a lot of things uh, in the outdoors together. Are your parents still alive? And if so, tell us about them. Yes, they're both still alive, and my parents are devastated. However, they're both strong, but their heart is broken, you know. October 16th changes our life you have been actively involved in keeping up with the case uh, discussing the case with law enforcement in particular detective norod there have been a lot of community activities that this case has also generated and tell us a little bit about that and your involvement in that well there's there's a reward now up to uh, fifty thousand dollars for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of whoever committed this crime it's been supported by Many people, friends and family, co-workers from the uh, the Nissan facility in Smyrna and also for the uh, Canton, Mississippi plant, Yates Services in Smyrna, Tennessee also. There's been a uh, fundraiser activity that was uh, hosted by uh, Murfreesboro Outdoors. The Kayak Anglers for a Cause actually put on the fishing benefit and, and Murfreesboro Outdoors hosted the activity. There were several donations from Rick's Barbecue, local businesses throughout Murfreesboro, friends, family. Even people that we didn't even know that just heard about the situation. And I'd like to personally thank everyone that uh, contributed or participated in any of this activity. I know that it'll never replace the loss that you felt, but I know that it's amazing when the community <clears throat> comes together for something like this. And I've been able to keep up with it both on the radio and in the, in the paper. I want to say this to you. I can't help but remember another case. It involved a another brother who was an avid hunter, uh, and he was murdered one morning, early in the morning, when he was out 
deer hunting and he had a twin brother and and i'm talking about lynn and glenn oran and that case went unsolved for a number of years and we were finally able to uh, make an arrest in that case and and get a conviction and i I never knew Lynn, but I felt like I did because of knowing the family, and in particular, his brother, Glenn. Yes, sir. And they were very close, being twins. Even though you're not a twin, you're close in age. You work the same job, an avid sportsman. So I say that to tell you that this case will be solved. I believe that it will. Just to hold on and stay in there and trust in Detective Norod and the Sheriff's Department, and I believe that this will come to a successful conclusion. Well, we've had a lot of support, you know, from from everyone, prayers, family, friends, and we've been very fortunate for that. Well, I want to tell you how much we appreciate you being here, and we hope that this program will generate maybe that one piece of information that's needed to solve this case. So, again, keep the faith, and thank you for being here. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you. We will continue our discussion of the William Greg Hawkins murder case with Janet Hawkins on this WGNS Cold Case Profile. Well, welcome Janet Hawkins today to our studio. And Miss Hawkins, this is the first time you and I have met. I was a prosecutor for a number of years and dealt with a lot of families. But tell us a little bit about you and, and how you met Greg, how long you've been married and things like that. How many children you have? I met Greg in Hermitage Hills. We lived and went to DuPont High School out in Hermitage. Just saw him and his brother riding dirt bikes one day, and I had a dirt bike, and they just looked like the kind of guys that I would like to hang out with and ended up liking and meeting Greg and liking him, and we were married for 33 years, and he was just a man's man. I knew growing up that I wanted someone like my dad who could do anything, fix anything, and that was Greg. He was just a man's man. And what year were were you and Greg married? We were married in 1982. And how many children do you have? We have two daughters, two great daughters, very strong-willed. My daughters have been my rock. And I know that in listening to uh, the case, I, I know that Brandy, I believe that, is that your youngest daughter? Brandy was fishing with your husband that morning, and tell us how this has affected her. Brady is very strong in her faith. Her dad helped me raise just unbelievable girls. She's just like her dad. They both are. They're they're honest. They're good girls. We've never had any trouble out of them. They're just, uh, they're amazing. You know, uh, as a man, we sometimes look to our son and think, boy, I look forward to uh, going hunting or fishing. But it sounds like that uh, Greg <laughs> made sure those girls were out there in the outdoors. The girls too. had to know what camouflage was. They knew how to, you know, catch fish. They didn't miss out. And even as they've grown into adults, they still have stayed close and still participate in the outdoor activities. They do. Tell us a little more about your husband. We know he worked at Nissan. He was an engineer there. Is that correct? Yes. And how long had he worked there? He'd been there 24 years. I know that Greg was a man of faith. Uh, I recall reading that he uh, that you all attended the World Outreach Church. Tell us about his faith. It was strong. Greg put everything first with the Lord, and thankfully so, because We sat down one night talking about how he was always prepared for everything in life he ever did. If he went to fix something, he researched it, he went in it, he knew what to do. And the girls and I kind of were a little bit angry among ourselves thinking about how dad wasn't prepared. And one of my daughters spoke up and said, Mom, yes, he was because he was prepared because he knew the Lord. I understand he had a quote that he would often recite. Yes, he did. Billy Graham quote. And what was that? That a true servant of God is one that helps another succeed. And he was that type of individual. Yeah, he loved to teach. He, You know, he Greg loved the truth. I mean, he just, there was no gray area with him. He was either black or white. And he just, you know, this person, whomever they are, given a chance, they would have excelled in whatever because he would have helped them get there. If there was one thing that you would like the listening audience to know about Greg or your family, what would it be? He was a giver. He was not a taker. Greg would give you his time. He would never invade your space. He would have helped them. Greg was my world. And what's been the most important thing to keep you going in this? My faith, my church. I tell you, World Outreach, to be such a large church, they have saved my life. 
anyone out there, if you if you you need help, find find your faith, find it. Greg would Greg would want a message out of this, and it would be, you know, go to the Lord. Don't go go don't go out there and do things that are not within the laws. There's help. Please seek help. In talking with Darren, we mentioned about the various activities that have gone on in the community, and tell us about your involvement in that. Well, I will tell you that I have met a lot of men that Greg has dealt with in the business world, just to, just to name a few that have really touched, that has blessed me out of all this, is uh, Randy Bolin of Murfreesboro Outdoors and Trent Peterson over at Clark Marine. Greg, he knew how to grab a godly man, and I tell you, that this world needs more of it. And the community has just been, I mean, there's so much love out there. It's awful that it takes something like this to realize, and and I know you've had people come up to you and talk to you about Greg, and I know, Darren, you have too, and about the effect that he had on their lives or things that he did for them that you never knew about. Unfortunately, the only opportunity they have is to now try to comfort you. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing. I don't ever want Greg or his story to go away, ever. And I want to say it's been an honor and a privilege to meet you today. You as well. I hope that this will be resolved soon. I believe that there's somebody out there that can help us with this case. A $50,000 reward is a large amount of money. There are people that have stepped up that have made this possible, including the family. I want you to know that we're with you, this community's with you, and good things will happen if everybody will keep praying for a resolution. Yes. Thank we, you. We certainly appreciate everybody's support. Greg said a prayer every day before he came in the house. Would you tell us about that? Yes, I get so excited when he'd come home from work and I'd hear him out in the garage. And eventually I realized that I was interrupting prayer every time I'd go out in the garage to see him. So Greg started staying in his truck in the driveway <laughs> to get where he wanted to be. Then he was all mine. <laughs> Well, thank you again for being here, and we'd like to thank Detective Norod from the Sheriff's Department, and we'd like to thank all the people in the Rutherford County community, the community of fishermen and outdoorsmen that have come together to help this family and hopefully bring a successful resolution to this investigation. Yes, amen. Our case today lets us all know that none of us can ever be completely certain that we will see tomorrow. We should live each day as if it were our last. We should tell our family every day how much we love them. The Hawkins family gives us all a wonderful example of how to combine love of family and love of God and how to use those two strengths to overcome the horrible tragedies that occur in our life. But we can be examples too. If you know anything about this crime, please call Detective Cal Norrod or make a confidential call to Crime Stoppers. You be the example of how to be a good citizen, a citizen who cares about this community. If you missed any part of this program, it will be available shortly as a podcast on the WGNS website. Rutherford Issues with Brian Barrett, hitting right at what matters most to all of us here in the heart of Tennessee. Weekday mornings at 10 on WGNS, AM, FM, and online. If you're planning an upcoming trip and want to include your pet, we have all the travel supplies you'll need at Animal City. This is Amanda at Animal City, inviting your family to come do business with my family. Animal City is Murfreesboro's hometown, family-owned pet store. We've had the honor and pleasure of serving the community for 33 years. If you want to see some photos of our adorable pets, feel free to check out our Facebook page, Animal City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're at 919 Northwest Broad Street, right here in Murfreesboro. Families love Adams Place. My daughter kept telling me that she wanted me to come to Adams Place. And I came here to look at the rooms. I decided to stay. And I'm not one bit sorry because I've been very well taken care of. And I have been very happy that I did come to Adams Place. Hi, this is Terry Deal at Adams Place. Call me for more information about Adams Place. Phone 615-904-9111. Adams Place. 
Partly sunny this afternoon, high in the 90s. And then tonight, lows in the mid-60s with overcast skies. Saturday, high temperatures reach up to the mid-70s. And Saturday night, overnight lows approach the mid-50s. I'm meteorologist Jay Marzik on News Radio WGNS. Right now, it's 70 degrees. This is Chip Walters, and I'll have Middle Tennessee football and basketball games for you right here. MTSU Sports on WGNS AM, FM, online. What's the law? Time now for an examination of the laws of Tennessee. This is not intended to be legal advice and is being presented solely for the informational benefit of our listening audience. You should always consult with an attorney whenever you need or rely on legal advice. Good morning, listeners. This is Trevor Lynch, one of the assistant district attorneys for the 16th Judicial District. And today I'm going to talk briefly with you about some upcoming changes in our juvenile laws. These changes will take effect January 1st of 2025. Before I begin talking about major changes, one thing to point out is that our juvenile courts, as well as our circuit and criminal courts, have what's called concurrent jurisdictions in proceedings in which a child is alleged to commit an act that would be, if adjudicated delinquent, require the child to be classified as a serious youthful offender. What that means is that the case may begin in the juvenile court, but our circuit or criminal courts also have jurisdictions over those proceedings. That is something that's going to come into play a great deal in 2025. 37-1-121, one of our Tennessee statutes dealing with juveniles, is now being changed and amended to state that if a juvenile is alleged to commit an act that would require the juvenile to be classified as a serious youthful offender then the juvenile has a right to a jury trial at that adjudication hearing. That is something that we've never had before. Previously, and as still as of today, if a juvenile is charged with any offense, and that matter is being held and conducted in juvenile court, a juvenile has no right to a jury trial. It's a trial by the juvenile judge. That's going to change. Now, a juvenile, if they're charged with certain offenses, even though that juvenile has not been transferred to adult court, that juvenile can still request a trial by jury. The juvenile must be advised of the right to a trial by jury by the juvenile court. The right to jury trial may be waived by the juvenile only after the juvenile has been advised of the juvenile's right to the trial by jury and after consulting with an attorney. A waiver of the right to a jury trial must be in writing and signed by the juvenile, the juvenile's attorney, the juvenile's parent or guardian. And the court shall inquire on the record to ensure that the waiver was made knowing and voluntarily. If a juvenile does not waive their right to a jury trial, then the adjudication hearing must be conducted in the circuit or criminal court by circuit or criminal court judge. If the juvenile is adjudicated delinquent by a jury, and the juvenile is required to be classified as a serious youthful offender, then the circuit or criminal court shall transfer the jurisdiction of the matter back to the juvenile court for disposition. The same as if the juror convicts the juvenile of a lesser offense that is not classified as a serious youthful offender. The circuit court still still transfer the jurisdiction of the matter back to the juvenile court for disposition. This is not the same as a juvenile being transferred to adult court to be tried as an adult. It is simply the fact that the the juvenile now has the right to have a jury of his peers make the determination as to whether or not he or she is a delinquent offender. If the juvenile waives the right to a jury trial, then the adjudication hearing will be conducted by the juvenile court. Tennessee Rules of Criminal Procedures will regulate the jury trials in the circuit and criminal court to apply in jury trials for juveniles subject to a classification as a serious youthful offender. There's also a speedy trial requirement to apply an adjudication hearing before a jury in a circuit or criminal court. Unless good cause is shown, an adjudication hearing before a jury in circuit or criminal court must be held within within one year of the juvenile being advised of the juvenile's right to a trial by jury. I've used a term, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it now, serious youthful offender. That is a new term being outlined in 37.1.131. And the courts will classify a child age 14 or older as a serious youthful offender if the child has been adjudicated delinquent for any first, 
or second degree murder or attempt to commit a first or second degree murder. Also, if the child is adjudicated delinquent for rape, aggravated rape, rape of a child, aggravated rape of a child, aggravated burglary, especially aggravated robbery, especially aggravated burglary, aggravated kidnapping, especially aggravated kidnapping, commission of an act of terrorism, carjacking, aggravated child abuse or aggravated child neglect or endangerment, any other Class A or B felony offense involving the use of a deadly weapon during the commission of an offense or criminal attempt of any of the outlined offenses or any other Class A felony listed above. Any offense listed above and the child has a prior adjudication of delinquency for one of the other offenses or the child has been adjudicated delinquent for an offense listed above and the district attorney general has asked the court to classify the child as a serious youthful offender. Also, the court shall cause to be made an audio recording of the dispositional hearing or the dispositional review hearing. The recording must include all proceedings in open court and such other proceedings as the judge may direct and must be preserved as part of the record of the hearing. If a child was 16 years of age or older at the time of the alleged conduct and is charged with the offense of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, attempted first- or second-degree murder, a hearing must be held in conformity with 37.1.127. The court must provide reasonable notice in writing of the time, place, and purpose of the hearing to the child, the child's parents, guardian, or other custodian for the at least a fourteen at least fourteen days prior to the hearing. Now, what kind of hearing am I talking about? It's not a trial; it is a transfer hearing. The child, if the court finds probable cause to believe that the delinquent act occurred, and the child is not committable to an institution for the de- de- developmentally disabled or mentally ill, the child must be transferred and tried as an adult in criminal court. That is different. As it stands today, we would have a two-hearing process. We would first have a probable cause hearing to make a determination. Is there probable cause to believe that the juvenile committed these delinquent acts? And then we would have a second hearing, a second transfer hearing, for the court to apply factors to make the determination should a transfer occur. That process will remain in effect in 2025 for all other types of offenses except those classified above, being the first-degree murder, second-degree murder, attempted first- or second-degree murder. If the court has that probable cause hearing and makes that determination that there's probable cause to believe that the child committed the act and the child is not committable, then the child must be transferred and tried as an adult. Another change is that the district attorney shall not seek nor shall any child tried as an adult in criminal court receive a sentence of death or mandatory imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole. Now, it has long been the standing that no juvenile transferred to adult court may receive the death penalty. However, prior to January of 2025, a juvenile could still be transferred to adult court, tried as an adult, and could receive a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Come January 1 of 2025, that will no longer be the case. If the juvenile court determines that the child must be transferred to criminal court and tried as an adult, then the court shall enter a written order detailing the court's findings of fact and conclusions of law. Following the entry of that order, the child is subject to being, an indict- or being indicted, have a presentation or information of the offense charged and presented to the circuit court or to a grand jury. If the juvenile court determines that the child must not be transferred to criminal court to be tried as an adult, then the court shall also enter a written order detailing the court's findings of fact and conclusions of law. This is because a new law is going to go into effect that will allow the criminal court, so our circuit or criminal court, having criminal jurisdiction, to review the juvenile court's determination upon motion of either the child or the prosecution. So if the juvenile court says this case is going to be tried or it's going to be transferred to adult court, the juvenile can then appeal that decision to a criminal court and have them review the determination. Likewise, if the juvenile court says we are not going to transfer this to adult court, the state can request a criminal court review the matter. If a motion to appeal is filed, then the clerk of the juvenile court shall file on a record of appeal no later than 15 days after the entry of the juvenile court's order. 
The criminal court or court having criminal jurisdiction shall conduct a de novo review of the juvenile court's determination, and the court's review must be expedited. This has to happen quickly. The review by the criminal court or the court having criminal jurisdiction is a review of the record only and must be conducted without an evidentiary hearing. So this isn't a situation where you're going to have both sides come in, present proof, make argument to the court. The court will review briefs filed by the attorneys. So the moving party will file a brief. The other party will file a brief. The court will review those. There will be no arguments, no other proof. After the court makes its review, it will then issue its ruling. The criminal court must issue its decision within 45 days from the date on which the record is filed with the clerk of the criminal court or with the court having criminal jurisdiction. If a motion to appeal is filed, then the juvenile court's jurisdiction over the alleged delinquent conduct under the review by the criminal court is automatically stayed until the review by the criminal court or court having criminal jurisdiction is completed. Now, I have left out a great deal of citations, statute provisions, and as well as a few exceptions that may come into play. As always, when it comes to our segments on what's the law, for me to have gone into a complete detail of changes in the law or what's occurring in the law, it would take a lot longer than we do have available for our current segments. This has been this month's episode of What's the Law. News Radio WGNS 100.5, 101.9, 1450. Online and on your phone at WGNSRadio.com. Do you ever wonder why big financial institutions offer you hundreds of dollars to open an account? Have you ever looked through the pages of fine print to see the fees and conditions? You won't find complicated sales pitches at Heritage South Community Credit Union. We are different. We help when others won't. It's what our members tell us we do every day. If you're tired of the hassle, it's time to try a local community credit union. Visit HeritageSouth.org to learn more or open an account today. Insured by NCUA. From brakes and alignments to new tires and wheels. Tire World, locally owned and operated in Murfreesboro, Smyrna, and Laverne. Tire World, we keep your family rolling. Online at TireWorld.us. This is Inside the Courts. A look at this month's trials, pleas, and grand jury action. Inside the Courts is presented as a courtesy of the Rutherford County Clerk's Office. Good morning, everyone. This is Assistant District Attorney Trevor Lynch, and today I'll be your tour guide through this episode of Inside the Courts. If you've listened to this segment before, normally you will hear we begin this segment by stating that none of the defendants named in upcoming trials or hearings have been convicted, and of course they are presumed by our law to be innocent. Today is going to be a little bit different. Everyone I talk about today is not innocent. They are not presumed innocent. They are guilty. They have been found guilty. We're going to begin with Corey Lillard and Gregory Lyons. Mr. Lillard and Mr. Lyons, on September 27th of 2020, caused officers to respond to 911 calls on shots fired on Gunnison Aversen Avenue. On arrival, officers located Mr. Javarius Malone. Mr. Malone had been shot by a single gunshot wound to the chest, died from his injuries. The investigation was conducted by Detective Cody Thomas with the Murfreesboro Police Department. From witness testimony about what occurred, they developed and determined that Mr. Malone had been attempting to try and sell a small amount of heroin. They were able to get into Mr. Malone's phone and made the determination that he was trying to sell that heroin to an individual named Corey Lillard. A known associate of Mr. Lillard, Mr. Gregory Lyons, was also looked into. And as it turned out, Mr. Lyons was wearing a GPS ankle monitor. Through the investigation, they were able to make the determination that Mr. Lillard and Mr. Lyons arranged to try and sell Mr. Malone a small amount of heroin. But Mr. Malone already owed Mr. Lyons money a whopping amount of $50. Because Mr. Malone did not have the additional $50 to pay Mr. Lyons, Mr. Malone was shot and killed. Mr. Lillard pled guilty to facilitation to first-degree murder and drug-related charges. He was sentenced to a 20-year sentence to serve. Mr. Lyons chose to go to trial, and in May of 2024, he was convicted by a jury of his peers of first-degree murder, conspiracy to sell Schedule One drug, attempt to sell Schedule One drug, and employing a firearm during commission of a dangerous felony. He was sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder. 
Judge Jimmy Turner, the circuit court who presided over the trial, sentenced Mr. Lyons to an additional 12 years to be served consecutive to his life sentence for the related drug charges and firearm charges. Mr. Jamar Marks. On February 12th of 2022, Mr. Marks had gone with other individuals to a hookah lounge. While at that hookah lounge, he got into an altercation, a verbal altercation. Mr. Marks' brother then got into a fight with one of the individuals. During the course of that fight, Mr. Marks went to his vehicle, retrieved a firearm, came back, and shot at the individuals that were fighting. Not only did he strike the primary individual that was fighting with his brother, but he struck his brother. And he shot and killed another individual that was trying to break the fight up. Additionally, Mr. Marks struck two other bystanders. Mr. Marks entered pleas of guilty to second-degree murder, attempted second-degree murder, two counts of aggravated assault. He received a total sentence of 15 years to serve the Tennessee Department of Corrections. He was represented by counsel Mr. Michael Rex wrote, and the state was represented by Assistant District Attorneys Matt Westmoreland and Trevor Lynch. Yo Sincere Fompon. Mr. Fompon was charged with first-degree murder during a drug transaction. He was represented by counsel Mr. Jack Mitchell. He has entered pleas to second-degree murder, attempted especially aggravated robbery, conspiracy to especially aggravated robbery, and received a total sentence of 40 years to serve in Tennessee Department of Corrections. I was a prosecutor on that case. This has been a brief glimpse at few of the cases that we have resolved over the past couple of months in this episode of Inside the Courts. As we end our program today, we thank our producer, Scott Walker. We thank WGNS for providing the airtime. Most of all, we thank you for listening. We leave by saying, a safe community is the responsibility of each and every one of us. For my two co-hosts, Jennings Jones and Trevor Lynch, this is Paul Newman, bidding all of you a safe and blessed day. The District Attorney's Office thanks you for listening to today's program. If you have any information regarding criminal activity in our community, please contact one of our law enforcement agencies. The information presented on today's show is solely for informational benefit and not intended to be legal advice. You should always consult an attorney whenever you need or rely on legal advice. Rutherford County's most trusted name in news. Talk Radio WGNS, Murfreesboro.